I am so excited to have Les here, uh, specifically sharing a little bit of his story, uh, how long he's in, been involved in youth ministry in all the different ways, but also giving us some insight on some games. And so before we do that, tell us a little bit about your story. Well, I was actually born in Liverpool, England. Came over when I was five years old and lived in California almost the rest of my life. And I didn't, my family wasn't Christian, but I became a Christian because of a buddy on the wrestling team. And we're still friends today. And I've been working with junior high, high school, and college kids for the last 50 years. It's 50 years today. So it's kind of, and I absolutely still love it. I love working with students. They still interest me, and I, I hopefully I'm able to help them. And and uh, yeah, and I still also stay in touch thanks to Facebook and other places with my students that have you know from the way a long time ago. So it's exciting to be still doing this thing. Yeah, and yeah. so and remind me, 35 NYWCs. Yeah, 35, maybe even a little bit, maybe 37. I was kind of rethinking. Oh uh, man, every youth specialties event. I mean, every conference for, yeah, last 37 yeah. years. That's amazing. And yeah. if I remember correctly, the only state you haven't spoken in oh, yeah. is Alaska. So right. we need to get them up to Alaska. <laughs> if anybody has any connections, <laughs> we got to make that happen. So you're the games guy. I yep. mean, uh, one of the best-selling books that we have is yours about the best games in youth ministry. So why, why games? You know, I, I have been in every state but Alaska, and I've been in 22 countries. Every place I go, they play games. I mean, games are universal. They, you can identify with kids, can identify with games, they enjoy games, and uh, they're a lot of fun. And also, I think games build community. I mean, the games that I pick are ones that, after you're finished playing, we're better friends than when we started. And that's the kind of game I like to play. And also the fact that I think a lot of sports today are becoming, you, you observe sports, you watch sports. But I think you need to play sports, and I think you need to play games. I think kids need to... Uh, it, it builds them up you know, physically as well as mentally. It stretches their thinking. It, it causes them to work cooperatively. So yeah, I, I think, and also it gives them a way to have fun without getting into trouble. So I think, uh, yeah, I think games still play and it should play a crucial part in our ministries. So what makes uh, the DNA of a good youth group game? Like what, what is that in your eyes when you're picking the ideal game? What does that look like? I mean, the things you want to look for and when you explain a game too is you want to pick games that are fun to watch, fun to describe, and obviously fun to play. So that when you're describing the game, you sound excited about the game. It gets the kids excited because they're fun to describe as well as watch and play. And also, I like to pick games that aren't very complicated. Some games have tons of rules, and you know, you're trying to figure out by the time, it takes like 20 minutes to explain all the rules and the game lasts like three minutes. You know, that was a great game. So I don't want to do that. And also, I want to pick competitive games that require little or no skill. You know, so, I, so I'm all for churches having like games like, or sports teams like you know, soccer or football, baseball. I, I think those are great, but I wouldn't do those in my youth group because a lot of kids have already developed skills in those. And a lot of the other kids won't play because they know they're not as good. My, my, I have two sons and th they started playing soccer when they were like four or five years old. So they were a lot better with about the time they reached high school than other kids. So we don't play those kind of games, particularly. I love to see them in churches, but we don't play them. We want to play where everybody's on an equal playing basis. So that way kids, because kids are really embarrassed. They don't want to be ridiculed. They don't want to be, they're, they're afraid they're going to make a mistake and look foolish. So I want to pick games where that doesn't happen. And also some kids don't want to play games because they have been embarrassed years ago. You know what I mean? So. So what I do with them, I let them watch. I don't force participation, don't do that, because it'll backfire on you. So I let them watch. I, I don't let them be rowdy or rude or doing something else over here, but I let them watch. And, and when they're ready, we let them join the game as part of the thing we like to do. And also I pick games, like I said, that after playing the game, we're better friends then than when we started playing the game. So when the game's over, we like each other better. Also, we try to pick games that you overcome a challenge and not overcome a person. Let's see, like, see, like a classic game that's played like in every country is King of the Hill. It's a great game. You try to be the top of something, a mountain, a bunch of balls or something, but you try to be the top and you're there for a few seconds and someone pulls you down and someone else is up there. And it's a fun game to play, a better game to play instead of um, King of the Hill is people of the mountain. So what we did is we got a table three foot by three foot by one foot off the ground, solid oak, really sturdy. We put wrestling mats all around it. And the objective is to try to get as many people on that three foot by three foot table as you can. 
So we've got like 17 kids on that table. You know, no, I'm piggyback, you know, arms stretching out over the edges, but it's trying to be people of the, of the, so we're working together and we'll bring that table out every so often and you know, try again to beat our old record. But, it, but then, it, so we're all friends then and when we're working together. So that's, that's the kind of game I like. I, I love the way that that brings everybody together. And, and so when you're, when you're showing a game like that, how do you introduce it? How do you set it up? Well, see, when you introduce a game, the key is you need to be, don't ever say, we're going to play a game. Right. Because, no, with, with children, that works great, right? When children, oh, wee wee, good, great game. By the time they're in high school, junior high and high school, a game sounds kind of babyish, unless it's a video game. But, uh, so you wouldn't want to use that. You don't, so instead of seeing a game, you would simply give them instructions on how to get, you know, get three of you get together, turn this way, go. And, and, and before they know it, they're playing a game. And they go, oh my gosh, you tricked us. We're playing a game. Yeah, and we're having a great time at it. So don't use the word game. The other thing, when you explain a game, explain it quickly, clearly, and simply. Because to me, again, don't want to make it complicated. Don't give all the rules. They'll figure out most of the rules as they play the game. If you give all the rules, it just takes too much time. And also you want to be so and clearly and quickly. So you want to get in and out so they're playing the game. That's all they want to do. And if you take a lot of time explaining it, they're going to be really disappointed. So also I would make sure you've either, you've either played the game or seen the game played. So if you, and the reason is because a lot of times, even in game books, including mine, you'll read it and you'll play the game and you'll go, oh, Oh, I wish you would have told us this. You know what I mean? Because you realize there's something left out and you figure it out, you start playing it, that, oh, I get it. So it's better if you've played it or seen somebody play. You may want to do a mini version. So what you do is you get with some other volunteers or, or a couple of kids and you try a mini version of the game and that way you test it out and you go, oh, no, I get it. And when you've done that, then you can explain the game, which I encourage you to do, with enthusiasm and with excitement because that'll get the kids excited about playing the game. Also, one of the keys is putting kids in their playing positions before you explain the game. See, what happens is if you just explain the game to a group like this, and then you tell them to get in their playing positions, by the time they get in their playing positions, they've forgotten the explanation. Because it was new to them. So if you put them in their playing positions, then you explain the game. The minute you're finished explaining it, bam, they're off playing it. I love that you gave us more license to play more games throughout our, our, our week as youth ministers. So give us some more just general thoughts when it comes to games. What are some more practical ideas okay. we need to be watching out for? Okay, so every game has a peak. You know what I mean? So you start playing a game. This is fun. This is incredible. I love this game. This is the best game I've ever played. Stop the game at its peak. You say, but they're going to get mad. They're going to get angry. I know it. They will. They go, no, no, please, few more minutes. Stop it at its peak. Every game has a peak. Stop it here. The reason you do that is because the next, in about a month or two, you introduce that game again, they'll go, oh my gosh. What they remember is the last 10 seconds of the game. <laughs> and so they're so excited, so into it, playing so hard. Now, some games you would finish, but a lot of games you just need to stop. And they stop right there, and then next time you bring it up, they'll remember that. But if you don't, Every game has a peak, so it goes up and up and up, and it's great, it's crazy, I love this, and then it goes, ooh, I'm getting tired of this game. This game's getting boring. This game's getting sad. I want to stop this game, right? <laughs> and if you stop it here, you'll never be able to play that game again. So you've got to stop it at its peak. It's really crucial. Also, on giving points, let me ask you something. Would you rather play a game where first place is 10 points or where first place is 100,000 points? Which would it be? <laughs> 100,000, you bet. But it, so here's the deal, so give lots of points. Some, I heard people go, well, I, I can't give that many points. They're not, it's just not money. <laughs> We're giving points. You can give as many as you want. So make, and, and so give lots of points. And the second thing is, keep the point spread close. See, if, if you have first place is 100,000, second place is 10,000, third place is 1,000, fourth place is 100, and fifth place is 10 points, if your team has 10 points and the other team has 100,000, you're going to not want to play. So you want to keep the point spread close. First place, 100,000. Second place, 99,000. Third place, 98,000. 97, 96, 95. If you're going to win fifth place or 10th place, we still got 90,000. We're still in. You know what I mean? So lots, so lots of points. Keep the thing close. And also, I, I encourage you to have a way of including 
physically challenged and those with learning disabilities. So now figure out a way to include those in your games. For instance, make them a photographer or the scorekeeper or get an able-bodied student to push them around in their wheelchair. But whatever you need to do, have a way of including every student in your games. I feel like that's a really, really important note. That's good for everybody to take note of. So any last, I mean, your, your, speak, your seminars are on games, but also on dealing with students that are, that are kind of more difficult to, to, to work with. Oh, yeah. yeah, and so maybe some final thoughts on connecting the, those two ideas or just some final encouragement for youth workers. Yeah, I, I, with working with kids that are trouble kids that, give you, that drive you up the wall, I mean, I think you got to love on those kids, and I think you want to involve those kids. Those, a lot of those kids have not experienced a good time in life. You know what I mean? And so I think if you can show them a good time, and this is a community, and I love on those kids, these, those kind of kids remind me of a Tootsie Roll Pop. You know what Tootsie Roll Pop, right? That yeah. candy with it. Yeah. The Tootsie Roll Pop, it, it's hard on the outside, and it's soft on the inside, right? Sure. And to get to that inside, you got to do a lot of licking. In fact, I, 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 I figured this out. It takes 270 licks to get to the inside of a Tootsie Roll Pop. It, it really does. I did it. Lick up the, so, so here's the deal. These kids, some of these kids are kind of hardened kids. So you've got to love on them. And, but if you're going to start loving these kids that are troubled kids, you've got to keep on loving them because they've had a lot of people come in their lives and then cut out on them. You know what I mean? You don't want to be another one. So you need to be committed to this. And it's going to take a long time to break to that through that hard, calloused outer shell. But there's a delightful kid in there, a playful kid. Who at this, when you meet them at first, they have this blank stare, but after you get to know them and they feel comfortable with you, there's a, just a delightful young kid that comes out. Uh, and I love seeing that, love seeing it. Well, Les, thank you so much for being such a great staple for us youth workers in youth ministry and uh, from the whole perspective of the way that you speak into our lives. So let's thank Les for being a part of this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.